Hey everybody, Mo here, and in this episode of Think Like a Pro, I think it's the fifth episode, maybe the sixth episode, I'm going to be talking about mid-range and tempo decks, the last archetypes that I haven't really covered. A lot of the time I hear people try to use these deck types interchangeably, and that's really, really incorrect. I hear a lot of the times people will be talking about a tempo deck, but they'll call it a mid-range deck, or I'll hear people be talking about a really good mid-range deck and they'll call it a tempo deck. And they'll think, oh, it's the same. Both of them just play stuff on curve and then you go about your day and they all play out the same. And again, this is really, really not correct. So in this episode, I'm going to be talking about the difference between mid-range and tempo decks so you guys don't get them confused anymore. I'll be talking about what makes a deck identify as mid-range or tempo. I'll be talking about how mid-range and tempo decks try to play the game as far as you know pacing and stuff like that and i'll talk about what type of cards typically go into a mid-range and what goes into a tempo deck so let's start by talking about mid-range decks most people have their idea of what a mid-range deck means and what it is and isn't but at its core a mid-range deck is a deck that is somewhere between the fast pace of an aggro deck but also the slower pace of a control deck this means that they can play fast creatures early on so you'll never out aggro an aggro deck but if the game goes you play enough early game creatures and cards to where you can survive early game to start playing your mid game you know beefy creatures and mid range decks tend to play out pretty similar similarly uh, by playing a good you know high value cards every single turn on curve and every turn they're playing increasingly more powerful cards. The average quality of mid-range decks are going to be higher and you know, will most of the time play several cards that push the boundaries between really broken and just really good stats for the cost. Mid-range cards also don't really rely on synergies within the deck, so every card should be good enough on its own to progress your board state or your game plan without needing a whole bunch of backup cards to help it out and because of this most cards that you'll end up playing are typically going to be epics or rares or champions so let's go ahead and look at an example of a makeshift mid-range deck by the cards that we were had available to us at second beta so keep in mind this is just an example deck that i literally made in less than 10 minutes for the sake of keeping things easy to understand and simple in this video so please don't write the comments with this deck looks like trash and this deck is the best mid-range deck why didn't you use it and all that other junk because I'm probably just gonna ignore it because i'm not taking this deck too serious so here's an example of a mid-range deck i just made first let's look at the individual cards in the deck you'll see that a lot of the cards i chose to put in the deck have really good stats for their cost you know you have cards like lucian who's a two mana three two which is good, but, you know, it has an ability, which puts it over the top. You also have the Darkwater Scourge, which is a 3-mana 5-5. Five five. And I don't believe there's any 3-mana cards out there that can really handle this. So I found that a lot of ephemeral cards could be really good in mid-range decks because a lot of their stats are super jacked for the price because there's the downside of ephemeral. So you get to play a 3-mana 5-5, five five, with lifesteal but the downside is obviously that it dies at the end of turn so you don't get to keep it um, however i could see there being a really good mid-range ephemeral deck so yeah all of these cards are pretty good for their pretty good stats for their mana cost or they have an ability that puts them overboard on their mana cost so you have a three mana two four but it also has the ability challenger which makes it pretty good you have a five mana five five but if an ally died this round, it's a 5-mana five 5-5 five five with Lifesteal and Tough, which is, you know, just really good. A 4-mana 2-3 with Elusive and Tough is really good. You just have all these cards that have really good stats or abilities that make them on, on par or just, in some cases, a lot better than other cards in their uh, mana cost category. Now, let's look at the mana curve for this deck. Because, like I said... Mid-range decks want to play powerful cards every single turn to continuously apply pressure. 
turn after turn until your opponent basically has no choice but to two for one themselves and then they'll eventually just run out of resources trying to deal with all of your threats because they'll say oh he just played this really scary five five creature i now have to spend two cards to deal with it and then the next turn you play another one and they're like crap i just spent two cards dealing with this five five i don't have another two cards to deal with this one or something like that though you'll eventually get to the point where they just cannot answer all of your threats uh, in this deck, you can see we have 6 1 cost cards, 6 2 cost cards, 12 3 cost cards, 7 4 cost cards, and 9 5 cost cards. So, for the most part, that's a pretty even number of 1, 2, 4, and 5 drops. The only outlier here being that there's a lot of 3 drops. But this is because 3 drops are really flexible. A lot of 3 drops are good on the aggro side of the matchup. So, if you're playing against you know a bunch of aggro decks and you need more early game cards to try and survive, you know, you have your early game three cost cards, but they can also, there's three cost cards in there that have more value the later they're in the game or the more creatures you have on the field. So when you are against the slower decks, the more three cards you have that are on the high end of value are good in that type of matchup. So this gives you a really good chance of playing a card on every single turn to apply the most amount of pressure possible. Again, the Big thing about mid-range is you want to consistently play cards, consistently apply pressure. That's basically the mid-range mantra. The best part about the mid-range decks is that these numbers are can always be adjusted based off of the meta. So if the meta is more aggressive, you can cut back on the number of five cost cards to play more aggressive early game cards. And the same as if the meta is more mid-range and control based, you can swap out some of the tiny, you know, do less creatures for the bigger heavy hitters. So this is, goes back to what I said earlier, where we have a whole bunch of three drops just to be kind of in a kind of like flex spots. So, of course, when the meta gets more, you know, when you know what the meta is, the meta gets more you know, proven and you're actually building a deck and not putting less than 10 minutes into it like I did with this one, your numbers can be a little bit different. You know, you can maybe shave off some of those three costers and then put add in another one cost unit, another two cost unit and another four cost unit and there you go and like now all of your numbers are going to be basically even and stuff like that so it all just depends on what the meta is like and what cards you have available to you um in your mid-range deck and how you prefer to play it because you can play the mid-range decks more aggressively by putting in more one and two and three costers or you can play a more late game more slow style controlly where you put in more kill spells or more late game spells and late game creatures so just as a test uh let's run through a couple of test hands now keep in mind that this deck uh, it could be trash, so how good the cards are, we're going to put that aside. And we're basically just going to look at how likely it is that we get a good starting hand for the next three games as far as spell or spell cost, card cost. So this is basically going to see if we can play... We'll just imagine that we have the best one cost card, the best two cost card, the best three cost cards uh, in our deck. So every card that we have for their number curve is going to be the best possible. So all we're going to be looking at is the mana cost, and we're going to see how likely it is with these numbers, with this deck right now, to get a card to play on turn 1, 2, 3, and 4. And we're going to be doing this for three hands, because we're going to be simulating three games. And I'm going to do it all in a row, and all without any type of cuts or edits, so that way you guys can see that you know these are truly just the first three I did, because... You know, I, I just did this right after talking to you guys about, uh, <coughs> excuse me, about the card cost and, you know, the mana curve and stuff like that. So you'll see me do that. And this will just be the first three in a row. So you, I'm not sitting here or you guys don't think I'm sitting here going, oh, show me a, a starting hand and I'll just choose the best three starting hands I get because I'd be pretty, you know, scuffed and not very believable. So let's go and go into it. So the first starting hand is going to be something like this. So this starting hand's already already insane like i'm literally going to keep everyone every one of these so um this is like i said you guys literally just saw me go from showing you guys mana curve to first starting hand here and i promise i don't care enough to go through and make 17 different takes on the first half of this video just to get a good starting hand because i'm also going to have to do this for three rounds in a row so hopefully we can get three good hands in a row but basically this is a good a really good example of what you'd want to play in your control or in your mid-range deck so you have your one coster here so like i said well, we're just going to pretend that these are just the best cards for the cost so it would go you play your one coster hopefully you you get to attack first you play your one coster you attack you play your two coster you attack you play your three coster you attack um that's three turns that go by 
you're more than likely i don't think there's a way to draw cards but we can assume since all but nine cards cost four or less in your deck and you already have one so all but eight cards left in your deck are four or less costing we're gonna assume you draw at least one unit or at least one card that costs less than four so you can play that card on turn four and then you have a back-to-back -back which buffs two units on turn five so you basically have something to play on every single turn for your first five turns and sometimes you can get lucky let's say your first two draws are two cost units then you can play a one drop on turn one this on turn two this on turn three and then when it's your turn four if you drew like i said you know two two cost units or a three cost unit and another one cost unit you can possibly play two creatures on your turn four and apply like a bunch of pressure that way so this is a really good example for a good starting hand so we're going to do starting hand number two so we're gonna i don't know if we roll will work so we're just gonna go ahead and do another opener so this hand looks pretty fine we don't have a one drop unit however because we have a bunch of early game cards because we have like something to play on turn two we can play this to buff our Lucian or to buff something on turn three. We can play this on turn four if we each decide to go to the creature route. There's a bunch of stuff we can do here. So I'm probably going to reroll this one because we have this card. Uh, so we can ignore the, te the text, but because this card works better with early game creatures, uh, you don't want to play spells early. So we can reroll that selected card and boom, we have another three cost unit. So you don't do anything on turn one. You can play a Lucian turn two. We can play the Senna turn three. Then we can play the Vanguard turn four, which buffs both of the creatures we just played. And then you can play this, and then more than likely another creature or another card on turn six, because you've had four draw steps, and the only thing you could draw would be one of your nine five costers. So if you draw anything that's not a five cost card, you can play two cards on your turn six and apply pressure because this, you know, makes your illusion basically unkillable and stuff like that. So this again is a really good starting hand. Minus not being able to play a card on turn one, you're playing something every single turn after turn one. So let's go ahead and do the third hand here. And this hand is just already godlike. Like, you have something to play on turn one, something to play on turn two to help your turn one creature not die. Like, this combo is really nice. You give barrier to something with challenger. So this can pull in your opponent's two costs. If they play a two mana three two, you could give this card barrier and then it pulls the three two. So. You effectively just killed a free unit. And then you can play either your Senna or your, your big ass 5-5 five, five on turn 3. So you're playing something on turn 1, 2, 3, 4, and, and etc. So those were literally just the first three hands I got in mid-range decks. That was really nice because you're playing pretty big creatures. You know, like I said, we get, even if you don't want to look at the text on these cards, you just want to assume they're the best possible 1-drop, 2-drop, and 3-drops. Every hand we had off of these first three hands were... Just insane. Like, we had Insane Curve. We were playing a card every single turn up until turn 5, at least, uh, with every hand except for the last one. We just didn't have a 1-drop, a 1-costing card. But you were able to play cards from turn 2 on forward. Like, I don't even know how many I could sit here and do in a row. See, this hand is not that good because you have a bunch of... I'm glad I actually did this. So I can show you guys what a not good hand looks like. A not good mid-range. So, you have your 1-cost card, which is really nice. However, you have like a four, five, and five. So if you keep this hand, um, you're probably going to lose, especially if you're against an aggro deck. They're just going to kill you before you even play all of your five cost cards. Or let's say that, you know, you get to turn five and you can play your one Garen or something. And they're not going to care because their board's going to have five creatures on it or something, and you're just going to have three. But luckily, we get mulligans. So we can choose to get rid of the three really big cards. And that didn't get rid of these. I don't know if that was a glitch or not. Uh, I think that was a glitch. Here, we'll, we'll do a... I think that was glitchy, so we're going to do a hand, and we're going to pretend the far left one is just the bird. Okay, well, it is the bird anyway, so that's good. See, like, this hand's a lot better. Like, you still don't have a two-drop, but you still just play a one-costing card, and then you play a card on turn three, turn three, turn four. So, you, mid range decks just have a lot to them that are really, really good. Really, really good. They're not super hard to pilot, but they're... It's some decisions to be made. You basically just have to know what is the best card to play when. Like if it's turn four, you have to decide, is it better to play my four costing unit or two two costing units? So now we're going to go ahead and get into the tempo side of things.
Tempo decks can be described at their core as decks that use precision timing and mana advantage to either pull yourself ahead in advantage or push your opponent back in advantage. Most of the time, tempo decks will win with a lower costing card that has been protected throughout the entire game, slowly hitting your opponent until they die. Since tempo decks are reactive by nature, it can play both the aggressive role and the control role. Uh, you play the aggressive role by knowing exactly when to go all in and spend all of your cards and spells to be able to pull yourself ahead, or you can take on the slower role by being able to play a small threat and then deciding exactly what to react to and whatever your opponent throws a card at you. Because you don't have to react to everything, you know, just like in a control deck, but you have to know exactly what to react to and exactly what card to react to your opponent's card with. So let's look at one of the best examples I can give on a tempo deck from my experience, and that's the Yasuo deck. Now, this is uh, my version of the Yasuo deck that I made during the first beta session. So some of the cards in this deck have been nerfed or changed, so they don't really belong here, but I can't go into... I can't log into Mobilytics to be able to change my deck list around to make it what it's supposed to be, so we're just going to pretend that this is the good overpowered version from the first beta. In this deck, your main win condition is going to be hitting with the Yasuo a bunch, and then continuously pushing your opponent's board state and advantage backwards, sometimes winning with Haymakers at the end, but most of the time with Yasuo. So let's look at every point I made on what makes this a tempo deck. The first point is using precision timing to either pull yourself ahead in advantage or push your opponent behind. This will mainly be done through your stun abilities and Yasuo's ability. A stunned creature can't attack or block. So depending on whose attack turn it is, you can use your knowledge to decide whether you need to stun your opponent to prevent them from attacking, therefore pushing them back a turn and not making them attack and putting them on the defensive for two turns or more in a row. Or you can decide to use the stun abilities on your turn whenever you're about to attack to make sure you can get in as much damage as possible to either set up for the kill next turn or to just go ahead and go all the way in for the kill. Same can be said about the recall abilities. You know, you can use that for both offensive and defensive as well. Uh, point number two is most of the time tempo decks will win with a lower cost card that slowly hits your opponent over and over again until they die. In this deck we have two creatures that do that very well. The first creature is Yasuo. When Yasuo is in play, he's already hard to block since he has quick attack, but he also puts your opponent on a 5 turn clock, which is not great, but when comboed with his ability to turn all of your reactive stun and recall abilities into you know, now kill spells because they do damage, it makes it really hard for your opponent to block because it takes this stun card that just says you can't block this turn to possibly not just a kill spell, just a two mana kill spell or something, which makes it really hard for him to be consistently blocked over and over and over again. And the second creature is going to be the Fey Blade Twirler. Now this card comes down as early as turn two and can close out a game really, really fast. The Blade Twirler also has quick attack, so it's hard for your opponent to effectively block it, as well as it gains plus two attack every time you stun or recall a card. So every time you stop your opponent from attacking, your Blade Twirler gets bigger, making it even harder to block. So your Blade Twirler is a 1-2, one one your opponent tries to attack, you stun it, it's now a 2-mana 3-2 with first strike. And so you just keep stunning your opponent's creatures during their attack phase so they can never attack, and you're forcing them to only ever block. And then eventually they'll have to block this really big creature that has first strike, so it'll be almost impossible to block or deal with without having some sort of spell. Eventually, you get to the point to where you can play a card that stuns multiple creatures and prevents your opponent from blocking at all, and then just end the game with one really big attack from Blade Twirler. This can be done through, you know, multiple cards. Final point is that Tempo Ducks can play either the controlling factor or the faster pace. If you're playing against an aggro deck, you want to choose you know, kind of the slower pace because you're never going to out aggro an aggro deck. They're always going to be faster than you at the core. So this means you'll have to find more ways to save more health so you can eventually play your, su your Yasuo and start killing off their creatures and relieving pressure. If you're against a control deck, however, this means most of your stun cards aren't really going to be as effective. So you'll have to play more creatures and attack with them as fast as possible in an attempt to end the game before your opponent plays their huge threats and game enders. Uh, to wrap up this video, I'll just review the main differences between, you know, tempo and mid-range decks. 
Mid-range decks like to play high value cards uh, every single turn to try and outvalue your opponent. Tempo decks like to play, you know, typically one early game threat, and then they try to use precision timing with spells to either push your opponent back or pull yourself ahead in advantage. Mid-range decks tend to win with bigger endgame creatures after several turns of combat, after applying pressure several you know, turns in a row. And tempo decks tend to win with really small creatures, but just by reacting to what your opponent plays and letting that small creature chip in for damage over uh, several turns. Mid-range decks are usually a jack-of-all-trades, but master-of-none style of deck by being able to play several high value cards but no huge synergy within them or really big combo in the deck and tempo specializes in playing the perfect answer at the perfect time to every card your opponent throws at you while saving your one to two you know main th uh, damage dealers in your deck so i know this video was a long one mainly since i decided to talk about two decks in one video but i figured it'd be better to put both mid-range and tempo in the same video so i can easily talk about the differences between the two and compare them side by side than to make two separate videos and have you guys go watch both videos so you'll understand fully what i'm talking about and just get more confusing that way so that's going to be it for this video i hope you guys enjoyed it um i cannot wait for legends of runeterra to come out this thursday i'm so excited it is currently tuesday the 21st so Legends of Runeterra, I get access to Legends of Runeterra on Thursday in two days, so that's going to be really exciting. Um, I'm going to be doing like a 12 to 14 hour long stream on Friday during the day, if you guys want to go check that out um, on my Twitch channel. On Wednesday and Thursday, I'm going to be, on Wednesday I'm going to be streaming possible deck ideas, so tomorrow I'm going to be streaming deck ideas. Um, and like, you know, theory crafting decks, as well as tomorrow I'm going to put out a video on what deck I'm going to be playing during opening week to first grind ranked with. So if you guys want to be curious on what deck I'm going to be playing at the, you know, the opening of Legends of Runeterra, go and look for that video tomorrow or catch me up on my, hit me on my stream tomorrow while I go over patch notes and decks and stuff like that. Thursday, from Thursday forward, I'm just going to be playing Legends of Runeterra on Twitch Monday through Friday. And hopefully I can continue to put videos out Wednesday and Saturday. I might bump it up a little bit more. So yeah, I put videos out every Wednesday, Saturday on YouTube. It's stream on Twitch Monday through Friday. So follow me on there. Subscribe here so you guys don't miss anything. And I'll see you in the next video.